Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zlatko Minev from IBM Quantum, and today I'll have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming you back to the Kiskit Quantum Seminar Series, live every Friday at noon, as well as hosting in just a minute here, Dr. Johan Pop, uh, Daria Gusenkova, and Martin Shvika from KIT. Uh, now, before we get to that in just a minute, let's give everyone about 60 to 70 seconds to tune into the live stream. And we can always begin with my favorite question, which is, where's everybody tuning in from today? And you can reply to that in the comment chat box on YouTube here on the right-hand side or right below, wherever it is on your device. That's the same place where you can get questions live during the presentation of our speakers today uh, to them. And I'll take those questions from the chat box and bring them to our speakers live uh, as much as time allows. And today I see that we have folks from Germany, from Cambridge, from France, from uh, New York City. So it's I'm so glad that everyone can tune in from such a worldwide audience and make this di the different time zones, as well as folks from Finland, Colorado, <laughs> Oregon. Uh, thank you folks for tuning in from all over. And uh, I think in the interest of time, with the last reminder that the Quantum Machine Learning Summer School from Kiskit is currently underway for its sign-up and will happen in about a month. And I think the sign-up just opened up again last night. I think with that, it's probably time that we just get right to it. Uh, so welcome to the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. Uh, I am your host, Slatko Minev. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming not one, but a triple <laughs> treat of speakers. Uh, we are glad to welcome uh, Dr. Johan Pop. Uh, hello, Johan. Daria Gusenkova and Martin Spieker from KIT. How are you guys? Pretty good. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's good to see you. Where's everybody tuning in from today? I'm tuning in from uh, my parents' attic in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. Um, well, folks, I think with that, um, if you want, you can pull up your slides, Johan, and meanwhile, I'll give everyone's uh, background. So uh, Dr. Johan Pop uh, is, uh, is a master in oh, yeah. but among many things, he did his PhD from 2007 to 2011 at the Neil Institute in CNRS Grenoble, France. He then spent uh, four years at uh, Yale as a postdoctoral fellow in Michel de Vere's group uh, with uh, yours truly at the time. So I've had the pleasure to know Johan uh, from that time. And um, I think with that, we'll do Daria and Martin's bios when we get to your talks. So if you'd like, Johan, the stage is yours. Thank you, Zlatko. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to start by thanking Zlatko and Paul and the organizers for, um, for the invitation to join this, um, this very exciting seminar series. Often when I want to, uh, when I want to relax and uh, look at something um, exciting, but but also entertaining on on YouTube. I I go to this uh, to this channel and I watch some past videos. So thanks again for um, for maintaining this channel. Today uh, we've decided. <laughs> so today we've decided to uh, split the talk in three. Um, the the main theme of the talk will be readout of fluxonium qubits. Uh, and in particular, readout of granular aluminum fluxonium qubits. I will uh, start with, a, with an introduction of granular aluminum, which is a common common denominator for the for the free talks in a way. Um, then Dasha will continue with the um, with the results um, on high power readout of of the fluxonium using hundreds of photons, and in the end, uh, Martin will present to us. Um, some very recent results um, un unpublished about the interaction of a stabilized qubit uh, with its local environment. So stick around for uh, until the end. Uh, there will be exciting uh, data. With this, um, I, I will uh, begin by motivating our work. We are very interested in fluxonium qubits because uh, they offer a very interesting spectrum, as you can see here in this uh, representation. Uh, skipping over the details, uh, this spectrum is very interesting because it allows a very high enharmonicity. So the, the first two levels, as you can see here, can, can be very well separated from the rest of the levels in the spectrum. And secondly, 
it it so happens that these higher energies uh, that I'm pointing out uh, in, in this plot lie in a convenient frequency range. They are in the gigahertz range, so we can use them to to, to uh, they come into play when uh, when we dispersively couple our qubit to our to our readout apparatus, and they allow us to have a very high fidelity readout even though the first two levels might be at very low frequencies. And there are some, um, there are many interesting results uh, over the last uh, decade that I'm highlighting here. This is, um, this is clearly a biased selection of, uh, um, of, of, um, um, of, of recent results. So it's definitely not an exhaustive list, but this, I, I wanted to highlight the fact that there are some recent results from Vladimir's group, uh, which show that this, um, these states can be split by only a few tens of megahertz, um, and this showcases the, um, the beauty of this, uh, of this spectrum. So the fluxonium qubit was introduced in 2009 in the group of Michel Devoe, and it, uh, as a circuit um, representation, it consists of a junction shunted by a superinductor, by a very large inductor that we see here, which is defined by the fact that it has a large impedance, and by that, I mean it has an impedance larger than the resistance quantum in the frequency range of interest, which uh, for us is in the gigahertz range. To, in order to get this very large impedance, uh, it's not easy. You can get it doing some, um, doing some highly um, skilled, I would say, um, lithography. You can get that uh, from from a geometric inductance. So I forgot to add here the, the citation, but there are some very nice results uh, recently from the group of uh, Johannes Fink in IST Austria. And he shows that you can uh, you can reach this superinductance regime uh, also with a geometric inductor. Um, however, in, in, in the historical development of the fluxonium qubit, this superinductor has been reached uh, using the kinetic inductance of Jolson junction arrays as showcased in the original implementation and in these papers following the pioneering exper experiments of Pat Delsing and David Havida. If we look at, uh, at an SCM image of the fluxonium qubit, you can see now all the components. You can see the what, what we call the face slip junction sometimes, which is the, the junction that gives the nonlinearity of the qubit. Each line here is a junction, so the small one it's it's the it's the central junction of the qubit. And all the other junctions that you see in this array, they form the superinductor. So this is the, um, we have, in this case, we have 95 junctions and their role is to give this, uh, this high impedance environment for the, for the central junction. You see that um, as, we, as we create a superconducting loop here, we have an additional bias parameter, which is the magnetic flux. And the, the interesting properties that I presented in the previous slide, apply for half a flux quantum in, uh, in this loop. What, what I would like to highlight also is the versatility of this design. So we can use the central junctions that you see here, which are, by the way, also made in the shape of squids in this case. We can use them to couple inductively, to share some inductance with a readout antenna, which creates our readout resonator and implements a circuit QED setup. You know, Qubit coupled to uh, to a resonator dispersive. With this, I would like to introduce what with this um, uh, description um, of the what I would call the first uh, generation of superinductors. I would like to introduce now what I will call the second generation uh, of superinductors. And there's no uh, there's no judgment of value here. It's purely chronological. Which, is, which consists in these ordered superconductors. So it turns out that we can obtain this very large kinetic inductance that we need for our large impedance. We can obtain it also by using these ordered uh, superconductors, such as, for instance, very promising materials like niobium nitride, titanium nitride, niobium titanium nitride. But these are not the materials I will talk about today. Today I will talk about granular aluminum and the details. Of course, today it will be a very short presentation and it will just be a highlight of the results. If you want all the details, uh, I invite you to consult these three papers. So a brief introduction to granular aluminum. The material has been known to the community for 
quite a while, since the 50s and, 70s, uh, and 60s. And it first attracted uh, the interest of, um, of researchers because, be because of its peculiar uh, structure, which consists of self-assembled grains of pure aluminum, pure crystalline aluminum, surrounded by an amorphous and non-stoichiometric aluminum oxide. And the fact that this structure, which is highly disordered, as you can see in these schematics, actually has a larger TC than uh, the TC of bulk aluminum, which is quite surprising. So uh, it has been known since the, since the 60s that this TC can reach 3 Kelvin or, or even exceed 3 Kelvin for uh, samples deposited, deposited um, on cold substrates. And this is to be compared with a bulk aluminum critical temperature of 1 Kelvin. The material has been um, studied also in the 70s and in the 80s, and its microstructure has been thoroughly um, analyzed thanks to the continued efforts of the, of the group of the Deutscher. And we, th thanks to these efforts, we now know that the distribution of the grain is remarkably homogeneous. So we have grains three to four nanometers uh, in size with a distribution of plus minus uh, one nanometer or half a nanometer even, again, de depending on the method of, um, of deposition. Last but not least, I, I want to mention an interesting um, material property re also related to superconductivity of granular aluminum, which is the fact that it is resilient to in-plane, <coughs> sorry about that, the fact that it is resilient to um, in-plane magnetic fields of uh, several Tesla. In our community, in the community of superconducting uh, qubits and superconducting circuits, it has first been used, to my knowledge, um, in the Yale group in 2012, um, when they engineered, they gap engineered the pads around a transport qubit. So they they used exactly this tunability of the TC with uh, with disorder to engineer uh, quasi particle traps. So my goal when I got interested in this material was to characterize um, its, uh, its, proper, its microwave properties um, in terms of uh, spectrum and nonlinearity. So basically the sur circuit quantum electrodynamics of granular aluminum resonators in their most simple form as shown here, simply a strip line. So we can understand, we can get a handle uh, on, uh, on, on the physics of this system by taking this strip line and slicing it in imaginary slices, one grain size, and we can think of each slice as, a, as an island, at least uh, for the lowest energy uh, uh, eigenfrequencies. And now you see that if we do that, we end up with, a, with an, an array of Joseon junctions where each junction has some capacitance to the ground and some self-capacitance. And oh, sorry, each island has a capacitance to the ground, and um, and each junction has a self-capacitance um, and a corresponding Joule energy. Once we do this, once we agree with this, I agree, very crude approximation. Once we uh, once we are going down that road, then we can employ the many results in the um, Joule junction uh, array community, and basically translate those results into our material parameters. So I'm, I'm showing here the most interesting, I think, um, for, for, for the design of superconducting circuits, the most interesting parameter, which is the self nonlinear elements so K11 for mode one in this case. And I would like to very briefly describe what we see here. All the way in, in front, we simply have a prefactor, which is given by some constants and some numerical constant in front here, which just uh, describes them the mode, uh, the, the shape of the current mode volume. Then we have A, which is the, um, the size of the grains in this model. And I do want to point out that this size can correspond to the actual size of the grains, or it, it could be an effective electrostatic grain, which uh, results due to, uh, from, um, uh, from charging, from electrostatic char charging. On top here, we have the, um, the frequency of the mode, which gives the frequency scale for the nonlinearity. And on the bottom, we have the two most important parameters that we can control experimentally. And these are the critical current density, or conversely, if you want, the, the resistivity of this material. 
and the, the mode volume um, for the electrical current. And these we can sweep over orders of magnitude. I should mention, I think I forgot to mention, that the way we fabricate this material, it's very simple. We simply deposit aluminum, pure aluminum, in a, in an ox in a controlled oxygen atmosphere. And we can tune this critical current density or the resistivity if you want. We can control it by controlling the deposition rate and the pressure in the chamber. If you want to read more details about this model, I invite you to consult this paper right here. And in the, um, in the final minutes of my introduction, I would like to walk you through the main applications that I see for devices made of granular aluminum. I think this can be illustrative to, to show you how this nonlinearity non enters into uh, design decisions, let's call them. So what I'm showing in this plot is on the x-axis, uh, I'm showing exactly the formula. So uh, there's nothing special there. And on the y-axis, I'm measuring the self, I'm, I'm showing the measured, um, the measured self curve coefficient, so the nonlinearity for um, a, a large selection of, uh, of samples where we sweep the resistivity and we sweep the volume over several orders of, of magnitude. You see here we sweep volumes from very small to very big in this case. And the resistivity also is swept from very small resistivities not that far from pure aluminum, very large resistivities close to the superconducting to insulating transition of this material. The frequency is pretty much constant because uh, this frequency is given by our, as, as you probably know, this is given by our instrumentation. And now the line, the line in this plot corresponds to simply a calculation of this, uh, of this formula. So there, there are no fitting parameters. And you can see that it catches within an order of magnitude. This is a log-log scale. So it catches within an order of magnitude the trend um, of, um, of, of the dependence of nonlinearity on these various parameters. And this allows us to discriminate with a color code, in this case, different applications. So for kinetic inductance detectors and for superinductors, for plutonium qubits, for instance, we want to be in this uh, region highlighted here in blue of very low nonlinearity because the, the nonlinearity in this case simply constitutes a nuisance. And we have explored this together with the NICAT team in, uh, in the Institute NERD in Grenoble, and we have built kinetic inductance detectors. And I don't have time now to discuss more about this, but I invite you, if you're interested, I invite you to, con to consult this paper. Now, a very interesting regime I find is this mid-range nonlinearity, which is the regime of uh, parametric devices, parametric amplifiers or frequency converters. And this is the, um, this is the type of nonlinearity that you need to produce a parametric amplifier. For instance, like the one that we show in this paper, which is still made with Jolson junction arrays, right? But uh, thanks to this model that I showed you on the previous slide, we are quite confident we can replicate it with, um, with pure uh, granular aluminum. And the interest of these devices, of course, is the fact that uh, you can increase your signal to noise ratio um, in, uh, at room temperature and you can measure quantum jumps of uh, qubits as we show for, it, for instance uh, in, in this plot. And I do want to mention that this is a very exciting collaboration, that th these results are part of, a, of an exciting collaboration that we have with a group of Nicola Rock from the Institute Land in Grenoble. And last, we can ask the question, is this nonlinearity enough to build a qubit? Of course, since I'm asking this question, the answer is probably yes. <laughs> so here are the results. We have built uh, basically a transmon qubit without using a junction, simply by using a very small volume of granular aluminum, as you can see highlighted here in blue, shunted by um, aluminum wires. And although this qubit doesn't have um, a nonlinearity as high as a regular transport qubit, so the nonlinearity in this case is about 4 megahertz to be compared with hundreds of megahertz for transport qubits with junctions, this qubit can do something that a regular transport cannot, uh, and that is sustain magnetic fields, in-plane magnetic fields. So, we have demonstrated that this qubit survives up to 100 millitesla. And at that point, it fails because of the aluminum pads, actually. So we are confident that if we replace the aluminum pad with some uh, magnetic field resilient uh, materials, such as niobium, for instance, 
we can reach one Tesla with this type of qubit. And what makes us confident is the fact that we have measured pure aluminum samples, which preserve that uh, resonators, which preserve their Q up to one Tesla in play fields. So with this, I think I would like to conclude this introduction and um, summarize. We, uh, by saying that we have measured similar dielectric loss tangent with thin film aluminum, um, with granular aluminum as with uh, thin film aluminum. I have not had the time to talk about that, but you can find this, uh, these measurements in our papers. We have um, obtained nanoherry per square inductance with a minimal amenable nonlinearity, and this will be very useful for the um, for the circuit that Dasha will present uh, in the next talk. And we have, um, and I, I do want to point out that uh, we have demonstrated that this uh, material, granular aluminum, can sustain, can preserve. Um, the high Q of, of resonators in the gigahertz range up to one Tesla. So you might want to use it depending on your application. You might want to use it also in the low impedance regime if what you want is field uh, magnetic field resistance. And with this, I, I think I would like to launch the question for the next speaker and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johan. Um, maybe also before we bring in, and maybe Dari, you can prepare your slides. Um, maybe quick few questions for Johan. Can you speak a little bit about the control and if you want reproducibility of the grant? Like how well can you control that nonlinearity to to what you know with junctions? There's also always some variation and so forth. Uh, um, but how about here with the granular aluminum? If you can say a little bit more about that, that'd be great. Yes. Um, so. We, I, my, my shorthand answer would be the following. With granular aluminum, you will have the same reproducibility that you have with, your, with the fabrication of your jaws and junctions. So if you have an evaporator where you can fabricate uh, very reliably jaws and junctions, then I, at least in our experience, when our evaporator um, produces reliable jaws and junction barriers, then it also produces reliable granular aluminum because the oxidation chemistry is the same and the oxidation conditions are the same. Got it. And in terms of the control on the inductance, um, you know, if, if you want to say hit an inductance of seven nanohenries, if you're going into transmon, uh, let's say 10 nanohenries, if you're going to make a transmon qubit, um, you know, is it sort of 10 plus or minus two or, or um, if if you have some knowledge, if you have some sort of broad answer to that, um, so I think there are better ways of doing it. But currently, our approach is to um, to repeatedly send the student in the clean room for a new fabrication round. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's, that's one that's one method that works. But we're we're hoping to develop more reliable methods. So um, you, you, you could imagine, for instance, measuring in situ, and we're trying to, to implement this now routinely, to measure in situ as you grow the resistivity of your films, and then basically stop the deposition when you reach the target. I think if we can do that reliably, um, we will have, I think, order of magnitude, a higher reliability. Mm -hmm. And you can also imagine doing some post-processing on your, on your films like for instance, heating or electromigration. There is a nice paper from the Ustinov group recently, which shows that electromigration can be um, can be an interesting method to tune even after fabrication and even in situ to tune the parameters of your granular. Got it. Maybe quick final question for measuring the self curve of the non of the resonators. Uh, uh, that's just from increasing the power and looking at how the curves bend. Uh, is is that how? Yes, for so for the very low uh, nonlinearity regime, that's what we did. So when we have subhertz per photon, of course, that's what we have to do. When we look at devices in the kilohertz range, then we look at the bifurcation power. So, and when we have qubits, then we don't have to do anything. We just read the, the X scale. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Johan, so much for this nice introduction. I think we also have your slides here, uh, Daria. Um, let me give a quick bio. So Daria Gusenkova completed her Bachelor 
degree in radio engineering at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, FISTECH, in 2015. She's participated in the International Physics Tournament, which motivated her to work at uh, MISIS Moscow and the group of Alexei Ustinov. And she started her PhD with Dr. Johan Pop in 2017. So I think with that, Daria, the stage is yours. Thank you, Zlatko. Uh, so to answer Johan's question, uh, can we build Foxonium with the granular aluminum inductance? Yes, uh, we can. And more than that, we can also perform the quantum non-demolishing readout at hundreds of photons in the readout resonator, which was not possible for other types of the superconducting qubits, uh, with the exception of Andreev bound states uh, qubits. And uh, now I will go to uh, the circuit implementation. Uh, here in the bottom, you can see the equivalent schematic of uh, our faxonium atom coupled inductively to the readout resonator. And the top image here uh, shows you the photograph of the device. You can see that we build our uh, readout resonator in the shape uh, of the dipole antenna. So it uh, couples to the uh, electromagnetic field inside the waveguide uh, through the dipole moment. And uh, here in the middle of the structure, you can see uh, the granular aluminum wires, which constitute uh, the inductances of the resonator, uh, the shared inductance, and this loop corresponds uh, to the uh, foxonium superinductance which is interrupted in the middle with the Jezuson junction. And uh, for this granular aluminum superinductance, uh, we measured uh, some parameters. And first, the impedance of the superinductance is higher than the resistance quantum, which allows to suppress the charge fluctuations and charge offsets in the circuit. And the internal quality factor is in the range of 10 to power 5, which is enough to preserve the coherence of the device. And uh, the first self-resonant mode uh, is around 17 gigahertz, which is well above uh, the first atomic transition and uh, the resonator frequency. And another two important parameters of the superinductance are the self-core coefficient, which is in range of 0 0.1 kilohertz. And uh, it is at least three orders of magnitude smaller compared to the Jezison junction erased. And uh, the plasma frequency uh, of this kernel aluminum superinductance is three to four times higher uh, than of the Jezison junction array. Uh, to introduce you to a problem of uh, high power quantum non demolishing QND uh, readout in the circuit quantum electrodynamics, I will start from uh, uh, the interaction between atom and light, the so called dispersive interaction, which realizes uh, the QND uh, measurement. And from the Hamiltonian, you can see that. Uh, the frequency of uh, the resonator depends on the state of the atom. Uh, the theory shows that uh, the signal to noise ratio of such a measurement scales as a square root of uh, the photon number in the uh, resonator, the measurement time, uh, the resonator line width, and some geometrical factor uh, which is proportional to a ratio between dispersive shift and the resonator line width. And uh, from this equation, you can directly see that for the fixed signal to noise ratio, increasing the photon number in the resonator allows you to reduce the measurement time. And uh, it can be reduced below a fraction of uh, the energy relaxation time, which in turn reduces the errors uh, which arise due to spontaneous atom transitions during the measurement. And this favorable high power regime 
was not realized in practice and usually the optimal photon number at which uh, we read out the superconducting qubits does not exceed 10 photons in the resonator. And this limitation comes from uh, several non-QND processes which uh, arise with increasing power. And this includes, for example, dress dephasing, uh, resonant transitions between atom and resonator levels, and also multi-mode mixing in atom resonator for melatonin. And in contrast to this practical limitation, we show that we can read out uh, non-destructively the state of our atom with hundreds of photons, and we believe that this is due to suppressed nonlinearity of the granular aluminum compared to the Jefferson junction arrays, uh, because uh, it should also suppress the multi-mode mixing in the Hamiltonian. And uh, also since the plasma frequency of granular aluminum is higher, this dilutes uh, the spectrum of parasitic modes to which our atom can couple and leak the energy. And uh, for our high power readout experiment, we used a slightly modified circuit shown here. And the only difference uh, is that we replace a single Jefferson junction with a squid, uh, which allows us to control the effective Jefferson energy uh, with applied magnetic field. And here you can see uh, the frequency of first two transitions of the atom as function of the external magnetic field. And uh, this point corresponds to the squid frustration. And you can see that uh, nonlinearity of atom changes uh, with the magnetic field uh, as the effective Jefferson energy depends on the magnetic field. Uh, so we chose these two flux bias points these two minimas, uh, where the dispersive shift is comparable with the resonator line width because it's favorable for uh, the high signal to noise ratio. And all the measurements which I uh, show next uh, were performed at these two flux bias points. First of all, we measured uh, the dispersive shift uh, as a function of the photon number, as you can see here. And uh, depending on the structure of the spectrum and the relative position of the atom and resonator levels, uh, we can get both positive and negative dispersive shift. But important here uh, is the fact that the absolute value of the dispersive shift decreases with the photon number. Uh, however, we were lucky and uh, this decrease of the dispersive shift is slower than uh, the gain in the signal to noise ratio with increasing readout power. And you can see this from the measurement time, uh, which is needed to obtain the fixed signal to noise ratio of three. And uh, it corresponds to the state discrimination fidelity of 99.7%. So here I show the measurement time uh, for both flux bias points, and we perform measurements without the use of Jefferson parametric amplifier. And uh, for example, on this plot, you can see that comparing the single photon regime and hundreds of photons in the resonator, we can gain an order of magnitude in the measurement time. And this figure uh, of merit can be further improved if we uh, use the Jordison parametric amplifier, as was shown with this uh, dimer Jordison junction array parametric amplifier. The same order of magnitude reduction, uh, reduction in measurement time can be achieved at 20 photons uh, in the resonator. Uh, of course, we are interested uh, how the qnd of readout uh, depend on the photon number in the resonator. 
And of course, the QNDness depends on the transition rates of the atom uh, when the resonator is populated to some uh, photon number. So we also measure uh, the transition rates. Uh, and for this, we apply the continuous wave tone uh, on the resonator. Uh, here we show the example uh, where a resonator was populated with 100 photons. And we record the output signal shown here uh, in blue color. That's uh, the raw signal. And uh, these two areas, the green and pink, correspond to uh, ground and the excited states uh, of the atom. Uh, the black line on the top of the raw data is the result of the two-point Lechian filter applied to this uh, quantum jump trace. So from the statistics of the quantum jumps, uh, we can calculate the transition rates between ground and excited state, uh, shown here in two plots uh, for the two flux biases. And with pink color, uh, you can see the gamma up rate. The green one is the gamma down rate. And in sum, these two should give you the total decay rate of the atom, uh, which you can also compare with the free decay rate, shown here as a blue line uh, with this uh, uncertainty interval. And uh, this corresponds to the free decay rate measured in the standard T1 experiment, where resonator is not populating uh, during the uh, free atom evolution. Uh, so what can you see from this plot? Uh, of course, there are some fluctuations in the transition rates, and there are some spikes, uh, which come factor of six. But first of all, there is no clear trend for increasing the transition rates uh, with the photon number. And if we compare this uh, to the transmon period, here I show the plot uh, which we extracted from the paper of Zlatko. Uh, for uh, the transmon, the energy relaxation rate increases by a factor of 25 when we increase power from single photon to 50 photons in the resonator. Uh, with this measurement, we can extract the transition rates, but we were not able to resolve the high levels of the atom. So uh, we wanted to perform more strict measurement of uh, the QNDNS. And this can be done with the feedback assisted state preparation, uh, which was possible uh, with this custom designed FPGA electronics made in the group of Mark Weber and Oliver Sander in KAT. And here I show the pulse sequence for the atom preparation in the ground state. Uh, it starts from uh, the uh, readout pulse, which populates resonator to the average photon number n. And we can evaluate the state of the atom on fly during this latency time of the FPGA board. And uh, if the atom was measured in the excited state, we apply the conditional pi pulse and we measure the result with the identical pulse as was in the beginning of the sequence. So the result uh, will be the fidelity uh, of uh, the state preparation. And it, it is also a measure of QNDness of our readout. And these three panels uh, show you the measurements performed without Jerusalem uh, parametric amplifier at 70 photons in the resonator. And we start from the atom in the equilibrium without uh, the active feedback. Uh, so you see two clouds corresponding to the ground and the excited state uh, with the uh, effective temperature corresponding to the fridge temperature. And we can reset the atom to the ground state with fidelity of 99% and uh, to the excited state with fidelity of 93%. And here you could also see uh, a third cloud, 
appearing in the vicinity of the ground state, which was not visible, for example, in this measurement. And this cloud corresponds to the spurious excitations of the next atom level, which we uh, were able to extract as a function of the photon number. As shown here on the left panel uh, with the yellow markers, uh, we show the F state excitation measured in the state preparation experiment. And we can also compare it uh, with the uh, simulated values. Uh, here, these calculations were made by Medita Vilsch and Dennis Vilsch from the group of Christel Mikkelsen uh, on the Ulrich supercomputer. And they can simulate the full system Hamiltonian, including the drive and uh, the decay for atom and for the resonator. And they calculate the result in F state excitation. So they find that these uh, spurious excitations come from uh, the local atom decay acting on the atom state while it is hybridized with the resonator. And here in the right panel, we show the state preparation error for the excited state and for the ground state. And also uh, with these intervals, we show the calculated values uh, from the measured gamma uh, down and gamma up rates. So we can see that for the excited state, the dominant contribution is uh, the decay of atom during measurement, while for uh, the ground state, it is uh, the gamma up rate and uh, almost the same contribution comes from the F-state excitations. Okay, so this brings me to the conclusion. Uh, we show that our fluxonium atom built with granular aluminum is resilient to uh, high power and to uh, many photons in the resonator. And we can perform the QND measurement uh, even without the Josephson parameter amplifier with fidelities exceeding 90%. And we also show that uh, the F-state leakage cannot uh, be neglected, even in case of highly nonlinear atom such as fluxonium. And it limits our fidelity at uh, photons uh, larger than 70. And with this, I'm happy to take the questions and I'm ready to uh, give the line to Martin. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dasha. This is really nice results. Um, so should everyone start using granular aluminum <laughs> resonators for readout and no amplifiers? Or, you know, what is what might be some of the challenges also and so on? Do, uh, if you want to share some thoughts on that. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, using granular aluminum allows you to perform high power readout and of course you can now do it without parametric amplifier but using parametric amplifier gives you extra uh, improvement of the fidelities and uh, we've shown that uh, we can achieve 97 percent uh, fidelity of excited state preparation very nice and um, maybe I misunderstood what you said that uh, I didn't quite catch what the chi of the higher levels is, whether it's, um, and I guess this is maybe a little trickier with this device, but uh, you, you said you couldn't resolve the F state, uh, I think. Yes, because it was so close to the ground state and uh, in the thermal equilibrium, uh, the population of ground state conceals the F state, of course. So we could resolve it without Jodison parameter amplifier, only if we perform the uh, excited state preparation. Wonderful, thank you. And folks, feel free to post questions in the chat and we can get them up here to to, every, to all the speakers. Um, I think just in the interest of time, I'm gonna thank you, Daria, and we'll let Martin uh, share his screen and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, today I want to show you recent results on how to use a qubit um, to heat and cool its environment. 
um, have this work as a result of an exciting collaboration between our group and Quantum Machines a startup in Tel Aviv in Israel. And they develop uh, quantum control hardware and software, and they really made uh, this project possible. To start with, uh, I will briefly talk about the coherence time for Fluxonium qubits, uh, which is here shown on the left. So we, uh, we flip the qubit to the excited state, it decays, and the decay can be well described by an exponential uh, function. And we measured for a qubit at uh, 6 megahertz a decay time of uh, 20 microseconds. And on the right, you can see the coherence time versus flux. And at half flux, the sweet spot, we measured 30 microseconds. And we could actually show in spin echo that uh, the coherence was close to be at one limited. So to improve our coherence, we have to increase the relaxation time for fluxonium qubits. And this is a difficult task, um, since in general, superconducting qubits have the problem um, of being short-lived, uh, especially compared to other competing platforms um, like spin qubits or trapped ions. And the reason is uh, that these superconducting circuits are macroscopic um, solid state objects that face various loss mechanisms. For example, uh, positional defects, um, for instance, in the oxide barrier of the Josephson junction, we have dangling bonds, absorbed molecules on the surface when we cool down the chip, and very subtle uh, quasi-particles. Um, yeah, and the challenge as, as an experimentalist is to disentangle these loss mechanisms so that you uh, can improve your circuit in the next iteration. And studying uh, these loss mechanisms often requires dedicated and you know, complicated experiments. And today I will show you a simple method where you can use the qubit as an interface uh, to probe uh, its environment. So loosely speaking, uh, we will turn the qubit into a heat engine. So how does it work? So this is a sketch of the experiment. On the top left, you can see the operator X from quantum machines that performs the whole experiment. And on the right, we have our fluxonium qubit that um, Daria presented. Um, yeah, and this qubit is coupled to an unknown environment. We can uh, read out the qubit uh, with a yeah, microwave pulse, roughly 120 nanoseconds long. Um, the pulse reflects at the cavity, the readout resonator of the qubit is then amplified by our homemade um, parametric amplifier, and then finally recorded and uh, processed by the FPGA board. And um, then with a latency of a few hundred nanoseconds, the machine can react on the me measurement outcome and send um, yeah, pi pulse to the qubit and bring it in its desired state. So this is uh, called also active reset. Um, so the experiment now works as follows. In the beginning, we have um, the stabilization sequence um, where we you know, stabilize the qubit either in the ground or the excited state. So for example, let's say we want to stabilize the qubit in the excited state. Um, we measure the qubit. When we find it in the excited state, we do nothing. And after some time, we measure again. And when we find the qubit in the ground state, we flip uh, the qubit back to the excited state. Uh, yeah, to the, to, in order to do this um, very efficient, we have chosen a repetition time of two microseconds, uh, seconds, much shorter than the lifetime of the qubit, which was around 20 microseconds. And yeah, depending on the experiment, the stabilization consists of n preparation pulses. And after the stabilization, we um, initialize the qubit again, either in the ground state or the excited state. And finally, we measure the relaxation of the qubit. And this can be done in two ways, either a standard 3 k T1 uh, measurement or uh, much faster, recording quantum jumps traces, um, which can only be done as long as the measurement is uh, sufficiently a uh, non-demolition. Um, yeah, so the quantum jump traces here are a bit different than um, those Daria presented in her talk, um, because she measured it continuously. And here, we measure the quantum jumps in a uh, stroboscopic measure. So we, um, we measure 
um, wait for two microseconds and then measure again. And yeah, a typical quantum jump trace can be seen here. So the qubit was initialized in the, uh, in the excited state. After some time, uh, we find it in the relaxed in the ground state. And then from time to time, it gets re-excited uh, due to the finite temperature. And when we average now a few thousand of these um, traces together, we get the stochastic decay of the qubit. Uh, this is now shown here in this plot for n equals 1, which is the unperturbed T1 relaxation. And you have to look uh, very closely to see actually a deviation from, uh, from an exponential decay. So then for um, n equals 10, we, it looks like that we are uh, increasing our relaxation time already. And if we keep on going uh, for 10,000 pulses, the relaxation in the end here uh, becomes so slow that we had to split the x-axis and uh, plot it in log scale from a 300 microseconds onwards. And note that we here measured up to 50 milliseconds. So uh, do we have this one millisecond T1 time now that uh, everybody's dreaming of? Probably not. I mean, you know the title already. Um, but yeah, let's look at the relaxation from the ground state. So the qubit um, is initialized in the ground state. And then instead of staying there, it uh, rapidly heats up. Um, yeah, which means that we just heated the environment of the qubit uh, with the stabilization sequence. Um, yeah, let's check maybe also the raw data to see that we are uh, yeah, confined uh, to the qubit subspace. So at t equals zero, um, yeah, we start in the ground state with an uh, infidelity of 3%. And from here on, um, the qubit heats up. And note that there's no additional f cloud uh, visible, like uh, Dasha has shown it in her plot. So yeah, the qubit really stays uh, in this uh, subspace, or in its subspace. And yeah, finally, the qubit reaches ovulation inversions of 54%. So the environment uh, must be inverted. And at t, t equals 0, actually quite heavily uh, inverted. Um, OK, so what can we say about the environment? Uh, first of all, um, it is very long-lived. I think that's evident. Uh, secondly, it can be inverted. But uh, most importantly, uh, T1 is constant for all stabilizations. And that is a bit difficult to see here. Um, we can extract this from quantum jumps. Uh, but when you look closely um, at the beginning, at the slopes of the beginning, and take the sum, um, you can kind of eyeball that yeah, T1 is constant. And this um, pinpoints to a bath consisting of two level systems, so-called a spin bath environment. And this is uh, depicted here. Um, yeah, and to get a simple model that can describe our, our measurement, we assume that this coupling, constant, uh, coupling strength is constant between the qubit and each TLS. And yeah, but um, yeah, the energy to transfer is altered by a mutually phasing and the detuning uh, between the qubit and the TLSs. So for the detuning, we assume that the TLSs are homogeneously spread uh, yeah, in frequency. OK, uh, finally, what we then do is we solve or integrate numerically the rate equation, the Pauli master equation. And yeah. We need at least uh, 10 qubits to get close to the data. I usually tr truncate the system at 51 spins. OK, and with that, uh, we can describe all measured curves uh, simultaneously, which is, of course, um, yeah, very satisfying. Um, yeah, there's still one open question. How do we know that the qubit um, heating is yeah, or that the qubit heats the environment and not all microwave pulses. So for example, you might uh, think that, for example, the um, inversion 
uh, could be a result of a pumping process, as we know it from laser physics. And we, of course, did several control experiments. Um, but I think the most convincing one is to, yeah, stab uh, to stabilize the qubit in the ground state and to see whether we can cool the environment. And indeed, this works. So the effect is now completely uh, reversed. Um, so for 10,000 pulses, here we start in the ground state, and the qubit uh, stays longer in the ground state and slowly warms up again. And you can also see a slight overshoot if you look at the uh, upper curve, upper brown curve, um, the, the qubit decays, and at one millisecond, it reaches uh, its minimum and then warms up again. And yeah, the final question, or the question we had now is this intrinsic to granular aluminum? And honestly, we, we don't know, maybe, maybe not. Um, but there was a similar experiment in the past by the MIT group. And here they showed that um, a sequence of pi pulses could change the relaxation time of the qubit. And in fact, we can actually reproduce the data. Um, the problem is, from their data, we, ca we cannot say if they saw the same effect that we see. And the reason is that back then they couldn't do this active reset. So, for, for example, they show um, only the normalized population. Okay, so we uh, definitely have to do or test our experiment also on other qubits in future. Um, yeah, and with that, I want to conclude. So the fluxonium is coupled to a long-lived TLS environment that can be controlled with a qubit. And from the theory, we could actually show that the population, we could reach a population inversion of the environment of roughly 80%. Um, the TLS path is the main loss mechanism. So that limits our T1 to 20 microseconds. And without this path, we would have a T1 of 90 microseconds. And finally, I want to stress that we have no idea what this TLS path is. And currently, our, currently our best guess are trapped quasi-particles. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm done. Uh, thank you for listening. And we are happy to take questions. Um. Thank you very much, Martin, for the nice talk. Um, folks, feel free to post any final questions for Martin and any of our speakers as we're coming up here on, on the uh, hour. And um, Martin, uh, maybe you said this already, but could you remind us the different times for the feedback loop and sort of how long yeah. each of the steps takes? Um, so the feedback, um, I think it's yeah. first, if you'd like. Uh, yeah. Um, so again, so the the readout pulse is 100 nanoseconds, and the latency. Then there's of course the time of flight, so 40 nanoseconds. I think the latency is around uh, 500 nanoseconds, but I'm I'm not totally sure about that. As a, we could do faster, but when we measure faster, we get into a non -de non demolition. Uh, we get non demolition effects on the readout. Got so that's it. why we stopped at two microseconds. Yeah. And uh, that's 40 nanoseconds time of flight uh, one way, I guess, or, or both ways? Yeah, uh, maybe one way. <laughs> Probably one way. Uh, one way, yeah, one way. I guess one way, yeah. Um, awesome, yeah. And um, uh, and so um, what makes you think that the TLSs are most likely trap quasi particles. It's a good question. Um, well, we see in uh, granular aluminum resonators that they are limited by quasi particles, so mm -hmm. we know that they are they are there, and we also know that they have a long lifetime. Um, so we can uh, measure the decay of the quasi particles with our resonators. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think it's yeah, it's just our best guess, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although I guess at the same time, even though they they get trapped in there, that the internal quality factors I think that Johan was mentioning earlier for the granular aluminum resonators are still can be really still very high and not limited by quasi particles primarily. No, or do you think quasi particles would be the main? They are. Yeah, I think 
in in uh, in high impedance resonators in the 10 to the 5 q range quasi particles are the dominant loss mechanism and we can see that by sweeping the by applying the method introduced in in rob sholkov's group basically mm. so we uh, we sweep the participation ratio and we look at the uh, we look at what happens to to t1 uh, what well, well, to to the quality factor in this case and we see that it doesn't change up to a point where we put enough um, energy in, in the lossy dielectric that it starts to go down. And that's how we know when dielectric loss is kicking. I see. Oh, okay. Based on the participation of yes. the dielectric. Yeah, uh, exactly. I see. I see. Got it. And in, in, you've played around with these quasi-particle injection pulses on the granular aluminum as well and looking at relaxation rates. And uh, Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't have the plot on my slides um, when they book up. But yeah, we, we can get exactly the same plot. So except that T1 is a bit longer than the qubit from uh, MIT. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. So can we mm -hmm. quickly go to the slide? I see. And the, this, uh, the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, do you remember the relaxation time, uh, the thermalization time? Uh, order um, Yeah, I think. They showed some milliseconds in the appendix for, um, I'm not sure, maybe this was the um, the time the quasi particles came back after the pumping. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I think so, yeah. Which could actually be our, our relaxation VC. So it's, gotcha. The problem is that we can't, they, they, could, they couldn't um, bring the qubit to the ground state. So you have, really have to see the, the heating up to make claims on um, yeah, if it's heat or if it's just uh, the real relaxation of the, the qubit. OK, yeah, very nice. And then if you but wanted to, oh, go on. No, I just want to say that we cannot exclude, I mean, the, all the things that, um, all the possible mechanisms that uh, Martin uh, showed in his slide, I think they're all, they're all relevant. Uh, and po possibly they, this is a com could even be a combination, right? I, it's not even clear that all these spins that we see in the environment are of the same origin. We might have some of them which are quasi particles, some of them which are dielectric defects, some of them which are dangling bonds. Uh, we just don't know. And uh, but but I think I, I'm I'm we don't know yet. I'm uh, optimistic that uh, with new techniques, with new new scanning techniques, we will learn a lot more in the coming years. Awesome. And um, quick question from the audience here related to this, I guess. Can you say that the environment, I guess, the TLS is saturated and doesn't interact with the qubit anymore? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think this is not really possible. So if you excite all the, all, all the Q, um, TLSs to the excited state and you flip the qubit to the ground state, um, T T1 will actually, uh, not T1, but um, gamma up will crash because there's a lot of excitation available in the environment that leak into the qubit. And so this is a completely symmetric problem. Um, so I think you can't separate the environment. I agree. I think the best that we can do is equalize gamma up and gamma down, which, which will buy you some fidelity in gates. So if you're thinking about doing gates, and you are dominated and your gate fidelity is dominated by gamma down you can heat up by applying some pulses you can heat up the local environment and decrease your gamma down increase your gamma up until you bring them equally to, to the same rate and then you are in um you know then 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 uh, your t1 has not changed but you symmetrize your errors so you 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 have the same error for preparation in the ground state and in the excited state. So the, the excited state gets a bit better, the ground state gets a bit worse, but the limiting one was the excited state preparation, which gets better. I see. And maybe you mentioned this, but um, in in um, stabilizing the ground state, uh, if you you know uh, if you now wanted to, what would be the next step to push that uh, you know from say 0.15 to closer to zero. Yeah, was there one main thing to tackle next? Mm, I think um, I think we were actually T1 limited. 
this um, three percent. So we can do a bit better because this experiment runs for several hours and then the calibration is off. We can do actually quite better, but like up to below one percent. Um, but I think in the end it's like T one limited. Uh, sorry, the calibration of. So I uh, okay when I start my experiment, I calibrate all the pulses, and then I just, I just let the measurement run for hours to get all these curves. Um, so I measure all the curves interleaved. So, um, yeah. so I, I take, for example, the 10,000 pulses uh, for 100 times traces, and then go, I go for the next curve so that I get them all simultaneously. Because uh, from time to time, you can see um, a jump somehow. So T1 changes, and then the curves are a bit off, and then you can't, can't fit them anymore. So, and that's also a, the reason why we went for quantum jump traces to measure as fast as possible. Great. Um, yeah, folks, can, to post any final I questions. Can, Go ahead, Johan. I just wanted to add that I think uh, going, continuing on the idea that Martin started, uh, I think we, in the future, we can go faster. I think we can go faster in electronics um, and we can go faster also in, in our readout if we apply techniques that are already existing in the literature of pulse shaping the, the resonator uh, excitation. And I think that will definitely buy us a few percent. I, I don't know if it will get us to three nines, but it will get us uh, in, in the two nine range. I think. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I think seeing as we're coming up on 10 minutes over here and in the interest of time, uh, if there are any final questions, folks, feel free to post them here. Also, this is maybe a good moment to open it up to Johan and, and you guys to any final sort of thoughts, comments, words, or, you know, uh, ideas you wanted to share. This is a, a kind of an open moment of discussion that you can bring up anything that's on your mind as well. Uh, so uh, feel free to, uh, to share anything. <laughs> Just keep, keep up the, the good work. I uh, I find this seminar series very entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and hopefully uh, it, it adds a little bit to our own knowledge and research as well. And uh, so I think with that, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today. I'd like to thank also our three wonderful speakers today for the great well, first of all, to congratulate you on the great results and great research and work. And thank you also, Johan, Daria, and Martin for accepting our invitation and for uh, sharing with everyone here your results. I think with that, folks, thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe so you can learn about our next seminar, which is coming up every Friday at noon Eastern time on the Kiskid YouTube seminar series. And with that, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.